Okay, <clears throat> so uh, welcome everyone tonight. Um, we have a guest speaker, Dr. Hirsch, that's going to be speaking uh, very shortly. Um, so before we do that, I'm going to go over the poll questions. So the first question was, okay. Sorry, what is... Never mind. Okay, uh, <laughs> what is the rarest blood type? Um, and the rarest blood type is AB negative. Uh, other question, uh, an eggshell is what percentage of its total bot total weight? It is 12%. Um, the third question was, what part of the plant conducts photosynthesis? It is the leaf. I'm glad everyone got that right. Those that I answered. Um, the next question was, true or false? Sound travels faster than air in water. Um, most of you said false, and if you said false, you're correct. And then the last question, um, Dolly was the first ever living creature to be cloned. What type of animal was she? And the majority of you said sheep, and you are correct. Okay, so, um, Real quick before we keep going, if you have a friend that needed to come in, don't wanted to come into the meeting um, and they weren't able to register, please send an email to prep um, at utk.edu and Miss Heather or Miss Susan will um, let you guys in with a um, invitation. Um, all right, so. I would like to start off with um, our presentation. Um, we're gonna have a few slides. Hey, Trixie. Can you Sorry. take the poll down, please? Oh, is it not? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Is it down now? Nope. Okay. How do I... Did you it's X dead it? on mine. Oh, okay. It might just be mine then. Oh, mm -hmm. because I, I you're the host. My apologies. You're good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, let me just minimize some of this stuff. Okay, so before we go on to our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Hirsch, we're going to go over a few things about SAYSAF. If I can... Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, for those who are new, uh, you welcome to the Virtual Science Club. Today is um, September 27th. Um, our Virtual Science Clubs are always on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, double check our schedule um, to check which Tuesdays those are. Uh, we had to go around a few um, Tuesdays just because of breaks. Um, we have two meetings per month, one for guest speakers and one for our mentor sessions. Um, it is open to sixth and seventh grade students, STEM teachers, and leaders. Of course, it is free to attend. Um, and if you would like to sign up for our next meeting, which is going to be uh, with our mentors um, doing breakout sessions by research area, you can go ahead and um, click, excuse me, take a picture of the QR code, and that will take you to the registration um, website. Okay, so a few things. Um, SACEF is now open for registration. Yay, exciting. Um, so we, in the next slide, I'm gonna show you um, the QR code so you can go ahead and um, look into the steps and how to get registered for the, um, for SACEF. Um, a few dates, January 18th is a pre-approval. Um, you must have your project um, registered by the uh, 28th of February. And then SACEF itself is on March 28th with the closing ceremony on the 30th. Um, and if you would like, you can take a moment to take a picture of the registration um, QR codes. Uh, on the left is our website <clears throat> um, that also provides all the registration steps. And then the SACEF website itself with the breakdown of all the timelines, including when your teacher um, needs to get started with your um, registration and then all of your project deadlines, um, as well as the pre-approval deadlines. All right, so 
these are the counties that are available to our specific um, um, engineering, science and engineering fair. But of course, if you live outside of these present counties, please contact your science teacher. Um, and if they know any um, science fair in your area. All right, so now we're gonna go over to Dr. Hirsch. Um, let me make sure, sir, you have a, everything good on your end? Yeah, let me uh, share my screen. There's always okay. issues with this. I think I gotta drop you off of it. Okay. And then come back on. Can you all see this okay? Yes. Okay, great. So the way on my screen here, I can't see the, the, uh, the chat boxes. So Trixie, if there's something that you need to tell me, could you just jump in and just interrupt me verbally so I kind of know what's going yeah. on? Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, um, hi everyone. I'll get going today. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Lou Hirsch, and I'm assistant professor in the Department of Plant Pathology here at the University of Kentucky, so just a couple hours north of you all. And um, I was invited uh, here today to talk to you guys about uh, not only like what I do for a job as a scientist, but also how I got here, because I think a lot of folks, especially in your shoes, when you're kind of new to the sciences and learning, um, think that maybe scientists, you know, spend their whole career in school, going to college with a very clear vision about what they want to do with their lives. Uh, and that's it couldn't be farther from the case with me. Um, so I wanted to kind of share with you guys my own journey, how I got here, uh, and then maybe share, share some what I think are cool stories from, from, my, uh, from my time. So without any further ado, I'm just going to get into uh, kind of my history all the way to when I became a scientist, and then some neat uh, kind of plant pathology facts that hopefully you all will find um, interesting. So um, first off, I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, and here's a picture of me with my dad and a carp we caught in some of the canals there in a pretty sweet acid-washed jean jacket. And I lived in Phoenix, Arizona until I was 18 years old. I then applied to colleges, like, like many of you all are going to do, and uh, I uh, got into Tulane University in New Orleans, which is a very different sort of environment, uh, as you could imagine, um, from, uh, from uh, um, Phoenix, Dr. Arizona. Dr. do you mind... Um... Did you share your um, share your audio when you prepare your sharing of the screen? Because someone I see. Well, so there's no audio built into my screen, but I see I see Rose. I was able to get the chat to work out. Rose, can you hear my voice? So oh, CC's okay. good. Something, Rose. When I I do this a lot, I'm muted often, <laughs> and then uh, that causes problems. But I guess it's working for someone, for Cece. Yeah, I can hear you too, Lou. Okay. Well, then I'll, I'll try to help Rose you. in the chat. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. So then Rose Tricks will reach out to you and they'll try and work something out. Um, but I went to college in New Orleans. Uh, and actually, when I was in New Orleans, I, I was, uh, I, I was and, 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 and finished my, uh, my college as an English and religious studies major. So totally different than what I do now for a career. Um, during the summers when I was at Tulane, I uh, actually became a scuba instructor, and I worked in the Florida Keys during the summer. So we got four months off uh, at Tulane, and I, I spent all four of my uh, college summers um, working uh, in the Florida Keys. Um, and then also, uh, in, in, in addition to that, once uh, kind of for one year uh, in college, and this probably predates everyone, almost everyone on this call, but I was a um, sophomore in college when um, Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, and it actually uh, flooded the entire city and caused the city to evacuate for about six months. So uh, luckily, I was already scheduled to go study abroad. So I was uh, actually uh, already in um, Rome the day uh, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. So I didn't, I lost everything I had that I didn't have in two suitcases going to Italy, which wasn't much because I was a college student. Um, so I actually extended my stay in Europe for one semester to two and lived in Italy and Rome, and it was very, a very cool experience. Um, then after that, I graduated, and then uh, my, my now wife and girlfriend and I uh, moved to San Diego, where I, uh, with my English degree, um, became a boat captain, and I actually managed a scuba diving charter company for two years um, in San Diego. Uh, and uh, although this is like a plant pathology talk, I guess, because I'm a plant pathologist, um, it's like a science club generally. So I thought I'd share some, some stuff from my, from my scuba diving days. And I still am a scuba instructor, and I'm actually doing a study abroad trip this year at the University of Kentucky. In about three months, we're going to Cosimo, Mexico for a coral reef ecology class that I'm leading. But um, for example, I got to do a lot of cool stuff with shark diving. 
let me turn down the volume here. It may be a little bit loud on your end. But um, I took this video. Um, this is not from my time in San Diego. This is from somewhat recently. Um, but uh, this is a video that I took in Fiji maybe four or five years ago. These are two Fijian guys in front of us. And they're feeding tiger sharks, which are, this one's about 12 feet long. Uh, they eat turtles whole. Hopefully this, and I think we're having some uh, connectivity issues, which is a shame. Oop, let me see. Of course, nothing works out like this. Let me jump forward. Um, and we can see, uh, kind of miss the coolest part here of the shark, but they're feeding these sharks like fish heads from this big municipal dumpster. And um, the shark actually got so close where I was able to touch it right now when it swam by. So it was about two feet away. Uh, and that was pretty cool. So again, totally unrelated to plant pathology, but um, I was able to, you know, experience these aspects of like the ecological world through my hobby, which I'm now kind of weirdly turning into like a part of my job. Um, and you can see other sharks swimming around in the background there. Uh, there was probably around us at any given point in that time uh, about 70 different sharks, which was pretty cool. Uh, and then lastly, just one more scuba diving video because I have them. A couple of years ago, I was able to go uh, to the South Pacific in a place called Chuuk Lagoon, where we sank a bunch of World War II, um, some uh, Japanese maritime boats in World War II. And uh, I'm a technical diver. I could do really deep uh, you know, wreck penetrations and stuff. And um, we did, this was 30 minutes weaving around um, hallways in a sunken boat about 100 feet underwater to where the boat stored big old torpedoes. Uh, so we're in the in, in the middle of a Japanese World War II vessel that, that we sank in a bombing run in 1944. Um, and, uh, you know, why am I showing you these, these, these scuba videos? I'm an educator now, but I started my career as an educator when I turned 18 and became a scuba instructor. And really what I do in my job now teaching about plant diseases at the University of Kentucky is really no different in practice than teaching people how to scuba dive. Um, and all my lab classes are just kind of scuba classes that I teach on dry land, essentially. Um, then um, my, my life took a turn and my wife got uh, accepted into the graduate school at the University of Arkansas. So I moved to Arkansas and uh, I didn't, I was totally unemployable with my English degree and my boat captain's license. So I um, re-enrolled as a non-traditional college student in biology because I wanted to do something with fish and I thought I'd make some more money than I was with my English degree, serving uh, drinks at Mariachi's Mexican Food Grill. Uh, and uh, I did a work study job for a lab. So you get paid minimum wage for just working somewhere on campus as a college student, washing dishes in a plant pathology lab. And I washed those dishes pretty well. And then there was a little science thing and I did that pretty well. And then it kind of turned turned into a master's degree in, in plant pathology, which I did pretty well, and then eventually a PhD in plant science, which I think I did pretty well. Um, so totally accidental. And I've actually not really taken a lot of the prerequisite classes that like most scientists take for their careers. Um, but then once you get your PhD, you got to go do another job because you're not quite employable yet. So then I moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where I actually worked for uh, the Veterans Administration Hospital System doing human genetics on combat veterans because my project in graduate school was fungal genetics and fungi and humans are really closely related. So I jumped from you know, agricultural science to human genetics um, for a year working with their Million Veterans Project, essentially trying to identify uh, common mutations that people have and link those to combat veterans' risk for developing like PTSD, suicidality, um, depression, and anxiety following combat. Uh, and then I uh, got into, uh, my wife got a job here at the University of Kentucky. I followed her again. And uh, you know, here I am as an agricultural scientist at the University of Kentucky. So I imagine a lot of y'all are probably from Tennessee and have stayed in Tennessee all your life. Um, it's pretty uncommon for that uh, to be, you know, to get a job in the state that you grew up in if you stay in the sciences and especially in academia, like in the universities like me, because you just got to go where the jobs are. And sometimes the jobs are far from where you're living uh, at that time. So that's a little bit of background about me. We could talk about this in the question and answers if anyone has any questions about more details of the story. Um, but now I wanted to, oh yeah, and also just mention a little bit what I do for my job. So I'm in the plant pathology department. We study plant diseases. I'm in charge of two different undergraduate programs. So kind of like your school's principal equivalent almost. Uh, and then I do a lot of work with teaching program admin, this sort of thing, talking to kindergarten up to senior high school students about science, and then a little bit of research. Uh, and then also I do maintain an active scuba profile. Uh, and I mentioned this because I'm, I'm actually now a, a professional scuba educator, which is weird for me, uh, doing the scuba diving study abroad class uh, in Mexico in January. 
So, uh, and I also, I guess I have a hobby of taking pictures underwater. So everything from sharks to clownfish because they're cute to war remains and here's me swimming through a wreck. Um, so I try and kind of blend all my different hobbies and interests together. So I'm always doing something interesting. So now we're going to shift pretty hard from pictures of scuba diving in my life to more agricultural considerations. So um, when I'm in in person here, I always sort of ask who was born on a farm. And when I started this sort of conversation, a lot of people would raise their hand, but now fewer and fewer people raise their hand. And that's because fewer people were born on farms. So we can look at the US in two different ways in this case. So the urban population, in 1950, about 64% of people lived in cities, but as of 2010, it was at 80.7. So, and these numbers are a little bit higher. It's about 82% right now. Um, but that doesn't mean that 19.3% of people farm. So actually only 2% of um, the U.S. population is engaged with farming. And some of this 2% is not actually what I think we would all consider to be farmers. They're people who, this is by tax records, people who grow enough produce or products on their land to count it as a farm, to get a reduced tax burden on their property. But they may just grow enough blackberries to sell the farmer's market for a day. Um, so it's arguably less than 2%. So then, you know, where do we get our food? Well, I think, um, well, actually, since we have a chat, could someone tell me where, where do you think we get our food? And I'm looking at my chat here window on a side screen. I'm just curious to see what you guys think. So where do you think we get our food? See if anyone's actually awake. I'll give us a few more seconds. Okay, so Zoe says the farm from large farms. Thanks, Bruce. Could be from small farms too. Imports, yeah, we import a lot of foods, especially seasonally. It's hard to grow lettuce in the States in the winter. Tennessee is a big egg roll. Yeah, beef and corn, that's right. But so most people probably don't go to the farm to get, to get, their, get their food. They actually get their food from the grocery store. So Tennessee, like Kentucky, big ag state, we know, or more of us know, that there's this really intimate connection between food and the land. But a lot of people don't know that because they're born and raised in the cities and pretty profoundly disconnected from agriculture. And most people, when they get their food, they think from the store. And if you look at this food here, kind of squint at the screen and look, and if you've ever been to the grocery store, all these products are uniform in shape. They're all really shiny. They all look really nice. And there's a tremendous amount of loss that occurs from a grower planting a seed in the ground to these products being super nice looking at your grocery store. The biggest loss is weeds, actually, globally is weeds. But the second loss to agricultural production are plant pathogens. So these are going to be microbes that makes plants sick. So the impact of plant disease is really hard to quantify, but super important. So in the U.S., and it's hard to, hard to quantify, but we lose about $300 billion of potential yield every year to plant diseases. These are rarely whole crop losses. They're often fractional losses. Like you figure maybe we lose 5 or 10% of our soybeans in a given year to various diseases. That's not very much, but there's like 120 million acres of soybeans. So any little amount times a huge amount is still a lot. And we can multiply this across all crops across our entire country. Um, and the global losses are much higher in ways we can't really quantify. Uh, here in the US, it just causes costs to go up because we're pretty sophisticated as a system and we can deal with losses. But in the global South, what we used to call the third world, it causes massive economic losses and famine and starvation because when people can't eat, they, they prefer to move where food may be. And then that causes also wars and just huge problems with the large scale movements of people. So plant diseases are super important for not only just our food on our plates, but also just global security in our place in the world. So humans have been dealing with plant diseases for like as long as we've been eating, but our records only go back so far. Uh, the first record of a plant disease that I've been able to find is actually in the Old Testament. Um, and uh, when th this is King Solomon telling the Israelites when it's a good idea to come to the temple of Jerusalem. And he says, when famines are plague, when blights or mildews, locusts or grasshoppers, when enemies attack, whenever disasters or disease may come. And I highlight blouts or mildews, and this is the English translation of the Hebrew, obviously, but um, we have blights and mildews now that, 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 that impact our crops. So we know if you come from a Judeo-Christian background, like I'm guessing many members of this audience have, um, we can trace that lineage back to plant diseases playing an important role. 
we could jump forward a couple thousand years. The Romans had one god for one disease of wheat. Its name was Robigo. And you can see, or Robogus, it depends on the translation. And on the bottom square there on the screen, you'll see a, a leaf and there's all these orange things on it. And that's called rust. And wheat would get a disease called wheat stem rust. And it's called rust because the fungus makes these little pustules on the outside of the leaf that's covered in billions of orange colored spores. So if you've ever touched a rusty piece of metal and scraped your thumb on it, you'll see iron oxide on your thumb. It looks a lot like iron oxide or rust. And uh, the Romans would host these big feasts called robigalias during harvest and planting seasons, uh, where they'd sacrifice red colored animals to robigo to bring good luck upon their harvest. Um, you know, we don't do that today for obvious reasons, but schools like Purdue University, for example, they host an annual fundraising um, uh, f festival called Robigalia, where they have a big bonfire and they sacrifice red colored stuffed animals uh, as a fundraiser. So it's kind of fun. Um, but humans have been dealing with plant diseases for a long, long time. And these two examples are from a pre-science era in human history. So people like every culture um, throughout you know, human society has turned to the supernatural or religion to try and explain the world around them in the absence of science. So um, if you guys were to buy a plant pathology textbook, which I'm encouraging you to do, but not requiring it, you'll find on the first chapter, on the first page, the first figure is what we call the plant disease triangle. And this is a way for us to think about what we need to happen for disease to occur. So we need to have a susceptible host. So it's not just a plant, but one that can get sick. We need to have a virulent pathogen, so a pathogen that's capable of causing disease. And then we need to have a conducive environment. So if the pathogen needs it to be cold and rainy, well, if it's hot and sunny, we're not gonna get a lot of disease. But if all three occur at the same time, there's a great chance we're gonna get a plant disease outbreak, which makes people like me and Dr. Kim Gwynn and other people on this call very happy because we get to use our expertise to help somebody. Obviously it doesn't make the grower very happy and it's not great for the plant. So where do most people encounter plant diseases? I took this picture at a farm we have in Kentucky, one of our agricultural research farms. These are two, these are two fence rows or two lines of tomatoes. There's a left variety and a right variety. And I want you guys to tell me in the chat box which variety of tomato plant looks better. Because you guys are trainee plant pathologists now, and I trust you'll be able to answer this. So left or right? Left, Bruce is on it. CC, Zoe, Claire, Rose, Rose twice, Stump, Fulton, you guys are doing great. So you guys are already well on your way to getting a degree in plant pathology. The left variety looks great. The right variety looks dead. And that's because, it, yeah, so there's more tomatoes on the right, but actually there's the same amount of tomatoes on the left. We just can't see them because they're under healthy leaves. Uh, in this case, the environment's the same. They're three feet from each other. Uh, the pathogen load is the same because they're super close. Uh, it's actually differences in host susceptibility. The variety on the left is resistant. The variety on the right is susceptible. So the variety on the right got hammered by two different plant diseases, uh, two different fungal leaf diseases, actually. So most people see this, but also remember most people live in cities and they get their food from the store. So they're not too worried about a single plant dying or a tree dying out in the yard or something like that. But there's been some huge examples of plant diseases that have literally changed the world and actually kind of made for this next example, the profession of plant pathology be a thing. So uh, if I were to ask you guys to raise your hands and say, who's heard of the Irish potato famine? Probably most of you all would have heard of this in some, some way. Um, I'm going to talk about the Irish potato famine from a plant pathology perspective, because this is not only the beginning of the discipline of plant pathology or the study of plant disease, but it's also the beginning of germ theory. Before the Irish potato famine, people didn't know that microbes existed and caused disease. They just thought food got moldy and that mold just spontaneously occurred because people didn't know that microbes existed. So let's set the scene real briefly for the Irish potato famine. So uh, Ireland in 1845, um, the English have essentially enslaved the Irish in their own land. And the English um, force the Irish to grow pigs and wheat and export all of those products back to England. But they allow the, the uh, Irish to grow uh, whatever they can eat for a year in a little tiny squares of land behind their hovels. And also, uh, they have huge families at this point because they need lots of little children uh, to, you know, to work the fields. Very common in agrarian um, older societies. And uh, the, last, the previous 20 years to 1845, the Irish had figured on two varieties of potatoes that worked super well. They grew really well, they were really disease resistant, and they yielded um, an amazing amount, uh, enough to feed these families for a whole year on one crop. 
However, in 1845, and newspapers were always so much better with words back then, but um, a newspaper in 1845 said a fatal malady has broken out amongst the potato crop on all sides we hear of its destruction, which is not good when you're figuring whole families are dependent upon potatoes for all their calories. So uh, it's a disease called potato late blight. And uh, its Latin name is Phytophthora infestans, which is English, or which is Latin for the English uh, infectious plant destroyer, which is one of the cooler, I think, taxonomic names out there. And it affects the above ground parts of the plant and rapidly kills them, which is what a blight is. But we don't eat the above ground parts of a potato. You actually shouldn't, you may get sick. Um, but we do eat the tubers in the ground, but it also infects the tubers in the ground. It doesn't have a toxin in, in it, but it will cause the tubers to rot and then other soil microbes will rot the tuber and then it's probably not good to eat. Uh, so this is what this looks like. Um, this is a, a modern uh, chemical control study. Uh, the variety in the front uh, has no treatment and the variety in the back does. And uh, this late blight occurs super fast. You can have total crop loss overnight. And imagine this is what, if you were the, the, the family leader of one of these large Irish families in the 1840s, you go to sleep, your plant looks green, you wake up in the morning and they look like this, your family's in trouble, they can't eat. Um, but luckily, uh, this is before refrigeration, but the Irish used or were able to store their potatoes in little pits under the ground. Um, and uh, they were able to get into these pits once their harvest failed. So not all was lost, but some families, when they got into their potato pits and uh, underneath their hovels, they found that they were all turned into this big pile of rotten, stinking goo because the pathogen had gotten in and infected all of the potatoes. So this is not great, um, but it wasn't um, across enough of the island to cause widespread problems in 1845. So in 1846, an early summer, people were hungry because they had a crummy harvest, but the national crop looked promising. But if you remember what the name of this disease is, we don't have clever names as plant pathologists, it's late blight. So it's a blight that occurs late in the season. And um, uh, in late in 1846, and I'm going to pardon my reading here, but a, a Catholic priest was walking through and he wrote in his journal, um, on July 27th, I passed from Cork to Dublin, which is about 150 miles. This doomed plant bloomed in all of its luxuriance of abundant harvests. Returning on August 3rd, I beheld with sorrow one wide waste of putrefying vegetation. In many places, the wretched people were seated on the fences of the decaying gardens, wringing their hands and wailing bitterly at the destruction which had left them foodless. Uh, which uh, I think is a pretty accurate story of how bad things got. So the Irish couldn't take two years of successive crop failures, and then they had famine. This is a map of Ireland of all the counties or states equivalent in Ireland, and all the ones that are red or yellow lost population following the famine, and all the ones that are green gained population. So what we see is this massive exodus of starving people from the poor rural areas to the cities because they thought there'd be food in the cities, but there was no food in the cities. Called the Great Famine in Ireland, it caused between one and one and a half million Irish to die. And these are starvation deaths, so like not fast deaths. And um, those who could leave left, about 1.5 million fled Ireland, many to uh, Europe, um, also a lot to the U.S. We can have whole classes on the Irish potato famine. Uh, sad and interesting and equal note. Um, I like this uh, Irish journalist quote, uh, the Almighty did indeed send the potato blight, but the English created the famine. During this time, the English still require the Irish to export all their hogs and wheat. Um, so uh, it's not just the Irish, it's not just this pathogen that caused the famine. It's, as most things in life, a more complex picture. Um, and uh, so the famine eventually ended for many reasons. One, fewer mouths to feed because people left or died. Um, the environment warmed. So our disease triangle changed. And then the British started helping the Irish a little bit more and improved governance within the island of Ireland. Um, so uh, the pathogen remained just as virulent, but the Irish moved away to varieties of potatoes that weren't as susceptible. And then the environment got a little bit warmer. So we broke our disease cycle and then Irish, uh, the, uh, the uh, famine wasn't um, such an impactful disease moving forward. It's still an important disease. Uh, there was, this is a little bit old, but uh, maybe f eight or nine years ago, um, this late blight disease, which could also infect tomatoes, uh, caused about a $3 billion loss to American potatoes and tomatoes. Um, and uh, it's still a huge, huge pathogen in the potato growing regions of our country. Up north, think the Dakotas uh, and Idaho. 
And the, the historical impact is really hard to quantify. So for this, I wanted to look at like famous Irish Americans, people who are here uh, directly or indirectly because of the Irish potato famine. So 22 U.S. presidents, a bunch of Supreme Court justices, the father of our Navy, Walt Disney. And I'm going to do a rapid fire things here. Some of these may not resonate with some of the younger members of the group, but um, these are all people who are here because they're Irish American. So Kurt Cobain, Alfred Hitchcock, Whitey Bulger, a mobster, Conan O'Brien, Bill Murray is a comedian, Bill O'Reilly from Fox News. Um, apparently, Kim, uh, Kim Gwynn, so Dr. Gwynn, her family came from Ireland. So thank you for being here. Tom Clancy, Mariah Carey, Christmas is starting soon. We'll see your music. Tom Brady, who's 45, John McEnroe, a tennis guy. Billy the Kid, a Western gunfighter. He was actually born here two years after his parents fled the famine. Um, interview with a Vampire, Ed Sullivan, the first TV show. My Cheat Girl, Taylor Swift. Uh, the general manager of the Broncos, Alice Cooper, Peter Griffin's character and family guy. Uh, yeah, he's a cartoon, but they're Irish Catholic. Um, Mark Calloway, who played The Undertaker. James Hetfield, the lead singer of Metallica. Henry Ford of Ford uh, you know, Automobiles. Um, it's always good to toss your spouse in there. So my wife kindly reminded me she's Irish American. So it's always good to get extra credit points like that. Um, and then because we're nerds and we're talking about nerdy stuff, uh, Dr. Charles Towns, who got a Nobel Prize in the 50s for inventing the laser. So we got the laser before the Soviets did, arguably because Dr. Charles Towns' ancestors fled the famine and landed in America instead of Russia. So um, there's lots of different ways to think about this. Some of these people may not be directly here because of the famine, but Irish Americans are an important part of our society and many of them wouldn't be here without the famine. Including, it seems like here, uh, many people on this call like Dr. Gwen and Jack. Okay, so we're gonna shift now to a more um, kind of contemporary or modern sort of issue here. And I wanna be sure that I'm keeping on track with the time. Um, but uh, people love bananas. We eat one variety of banana in this country. It's called Cavendish. Compare that to apples. We eat tons of apples, Granny Smith, Fuji, Gala, Red Delicious, even though they're not delicious, all these different kinds. Um, when it says we feed or uh, employees or feeds 400 million, that doesn't count us. These are people who are you know, subsistence living on bananas. Uh, we eat more of this one variety of uh, banana called Cavendish than any other fruit more than apples and oranges combined. So Seth, I see in all caps, loves bananas. A lot of people love bananas. Americans love. Uh, yeah, and Rose, you're right. Um, that, see, so some people have lots of thoughts about apples. Remember how much you guys care about different types of apples because we're gonna talk about why we're gonna be seeing some different types of bananas out there. So cultivated bananas are clonal. I've been to Costa Rica and Nicaragua and looked at banana plantation. You could be up on a mountain and look and every green leaf you see for as far as you can see in these tropical environments are all banana plants and they're all genetically identical. That's great from an agronomic or an agricultural perspective because they all grow about the same time. The bananas all look different because we don't buy weird looking bananas as consumers. They all take the same amount of nutrition and then they all mature at about the same rate. But there's a downside when all of your plants are clonal, so they're all genetically identical. When a pathogen is able to, uh, to overcome or evolve the ability to overcome the natural resistances that plants have to their infection, well, then every single plant is susceptible. And we're seeing that now with bananas, just as our parents and grandparents saw this with bananas in the 1950s. So pre-1950, everyone in this country ate the Gros Michel banana. It was uh, discovered on the French island of Martinique, so it has a French name. Uh, I've actually had these before in Cambodia. They're commercially extinct now, but they're still kind of around. And uh, these are way better bananas than the bananas we have. Um, these are chewier, but in a good way, and way sweeter. The bananas we have are like the equivalent of rolling up a paper towel and biting it. That's how bad I think our current variety of Cavendish bananas are compared to the Gros Michel bananas. So why don't we have these anymore? Well, they got killed by a disease called Panama disease. And everyone called them Big Mike because that's easier for our Western tongues to say than the French. It's caused by a pathogen named Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis cubensi, which is a ridiculous name. So we call it FOC. That's a lot easier. And believe it or not, because remember I said we're not very creative as a bunch of scientists, this was originally described in Panama in the 1940s. So um, as you can see here in this picture, the, uh, gray plant, the, the brown plant shouldn't be brown, should be green. 
So what happens is that this pathogen will, lives in the soil, it'll burrow into the roots, and this is a cross-section of a, of, a, a, um, uh, a banana tree. It should be this sort of whitish color all throughout. Anywhere you see red, it's a pigment the fungus makes as it's growing through the vascular system and clogging up the water pipes. Uh, so what happens specifically is that as the fungus colonizes the xylem, it chokes out the water so the plant is no longer in a tropical forest, it's in a barren desert and it just dies of drought because it can't get any water. So that's not great. And uh, we also can't rotate away from these. Uh, these. These fungi that grow in the soil that cause disease make a special survival structure called a clematospore. Don't worry, there's not gonna be a quiz. But that can persist in the soil without a host for 15 years. So you can't like wait a while and plant new um, plants uh, because it'll just infect the new ones. So um, race one and race two of this pathogen killed all of the gross Mitchell bananas where, where we got our bananas. And that was uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Tropical race four or TR4 uh, was discovered in uh, the uh, sort, of, uh, sort of Asian area, yeah, the Asian archipelago uh, about 15 years ago. But we have this nice ocean between us. However, in 2019, uh, they discovered some in Colombia. And since then, last month, they just characterized some in Peru. It's now in Central America. So this pathogen now has avoided our quarantine of the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean and is now moving throughout where we get all of our bananas. If you go to the store and look at the sticker on your banana, it'll say probably somewhere in Central America, maybe South America. So now that means all of our bananas, which are very susceptible to this pathogen, are probably going to end up dying in the next 10 or 15 years or so. Um, chemical control doesn't work. It's too toxic. In biological control, so using other microbes to kill the microbes you don't want, it doesn't really work. Quarantine uh, is not effective for long. It is for a while. But then the introduction of resistant varieties is effective. And one thing I want to pitch here, and I always give this when I talk to folks, is pretty quick, in some amount of time, the next decade or so, we'll see bananas get more and more expensive because more and more banana trees are dying. And then we're not going to have a lot of bananas anymore. But they'll be very expensive if we do have them. But what we're going to start to see also is, yeah, that's a good, yeah, good, Jack. Banana republics are just about to become republics. Yeah, I mean, in, in some cases, yes. But we're going to see now weird looking bananas at the store. They'll be shorter. They'll be redder. They may have different kind of shapes and curves to them. What those bananas represent are a resistant variety of banana that some grower somewhere is trying to get people like us to buy so we can then give them incentive to plant more bananas of that type. So just how we have all these different types of apples, I dream for a future when my five-year-old son can go to the store and have just as many options of bananas. And we as consumers need to help the growers make those choices by taking a chance on a weird looking banana at the store. Um, I don't know what y'all have in Tennessee. We have Kroger's here in Kentucky. Always in Kroger by, by in our case, kind of like uh, by the pineapples, there's like a little tropical fruit section sometimes. And it's real variable what they have. They got weird stuff, jackfruit, dragon fruit, things like that. But sometimes they have weird bananas and I always buy them. They're just like 50 cents more. Give them a shot. You may really like them. I like little tiny red ones. I think they're dwarf reds, they call them. But that represents resistant banana varieties that'll help uh, us and our kids and our society have access to more bananas. Um, and Seth apparently said is a banana. So that's maybe stay out of Kroger. Someone will buy it. One last little note here. Um, the little spots on bananas, they're actually not a normal part of a banana. I used to think um, that they were just a normal part of the banana. They're not actually. They're, they're a disease called anthracnose. that's caused by this fungus called Totrica muse. Um, and uh, it's not actually toxic or anything. They're fungi that, that uh, just penetrate in and eat the, the sugar from when the banana is ripening. So I'm going to go to a little bit of some bio, some bio here just to kind of, this is really cool biology. So somewhere in the field, wherever these bananas are growing, the, the C's here stand for canidia, and it's a fancy name for a spore. When the spores land on the rind of the banana, they'll germinate and form what is called an A here. That's an apressorium. And an apressorium acts as like a penetration structure, kind of like an oil derrick. And it allows the fungus to exert incredible force to punch through the skin of that banana peel. So yeah, uh, and these forces are incredible. Specifically, it's on average about 16.8 micronewtons of force with a standard deviation of 3.2 micronewtons of force, which rest assured doesn't mean anything to me because I'm not good with math, nor am I a physicist. Uh, but Google has really good um, uh, tools. So, um, so, uh, yeah, so, that, so, so, so Eli asks, 
Um, is there a banana with lots of brown spots have less sugar? No, it uh, it has lots of sugar and these fungi are, are penetrating and trying to get at that sugar. By the time the fungi start eating that sugar, the banana is so overripe that it's only good for banana bread, essentially. Um, in the dark areas on the edible part of the banana, if it's like a bruise is probably what you're talking about. Bananas aren't very strong. So if they get pressed or pushed or damaged during shipment, you often get like a big black streak or something like that. So good question, Jack. But um, so these forces, this doesn't mean anything to anyone, 6.8 micronewtons. But if you were to scale up this force to say somebody my size, I'm 175 pounds, it's the force of me being able to punch through a plate of steel that's an inch and a half thick. Or me, as a 175-pound guy, being able to uh, lift and curl a hook and ladder fire truck 15 times. So it's incredible force, and it's really no different than this karate guy punching through a cinder block wall. I always try and put a ninja gif in all of my various presentations. Um, but uh, it's second in, uh, in, in, in strength in nature to like meteor strikes, earthquakes, and volcano eruptions. It just occurs microscopically in our bananas and our counter, so we don't really think about it very often. So think about those cool forces when you're eating your banana for breakfast tomorrow. Last example, then we'll get to the Q&A. Citrus is a billion dollar industry. We love citrus here. We eat it in lemons, oranges, limes, grapefruits, tangerines, kumquats, a lot of stuff. And they're all imperiled by a disease called citrus. And I can't do it way long being. It's a word from Mandarin. So we call it citrus greening. It's easier for the Western tongue to pronounce. And it's three different species of bacteria that are vectored by an almost microscopic insect called a citrus psyllid. And you need the citrus psyllid to bite into a citrus tree and then transmit the bacteria via its feeding mouth parts. Once infected, trees die within five years. There's no resistance and there's no cure that we can use right now. Scientists have found some, but they're not um, um, available yet. So this is bad and it's here. So here's what a citrus tree looks like when it has greening. And you don't have to be a citrusologist to know this isn't a healthy looking tree. It gets its greening by, uh, it turns oranges green. Uh, and these are before they wither or die. So this was discovered first in 1919, and it, the pathogen had probably been in Asia forever, right? Science was just coming on board here at this time. But we got a big old ocean, so it's kind of protected. In 1998, in Florida, they found the Asian citrus psyllid, probably slipped in through some imports. We could only check about 2% of our global food imports, so we're not looking at most things that come into our country. But without the pathogen, no big deal. However, in 2005, uh, in Florida, they found one of these pathogenic bacteria species. So with vector and pathogen, and the environment's great, and the hosts are all susceptible, well, now we get uh, epidemic. So this is an old map, but I don't need to get a new one. Every one of these little pink dots, and you can see the, um, uh, the positive counties there on the red and the small square, um, all have positive uh, presence of citrus greening. And we, get, we got most of our citrus from Florida. Uh, you should manage your grove as if you already have greening. Okay, so what are the management strategies for greening? Um, quarantine, which you can't, that's not really effective anymore. Disease-free grafting doesn't work. Roguing of diseased plants. Roguing means to destroy. So the recommendation for a lot of Florida is to burn your diseased plants, um, which is challenging because it's already all throughout Florida. And there are some GE approaches. Uh, I forgot to, um, foolishly in this slide, um, put up a picture of, um, of uh, orange juice cans, uh, you know, or jugs of orange juice. And um, for, the, for, uh, for the longest time, one of the main orange juice companies had uh, made with, 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 with fresh Florida oranges. That was their big advertising line. Um, but they quietly got away with that sign maybe, oh, I don't know, six or seven years ago because Florida citrus was so crushed by this disease and continues to be that now we import most of our orange juice from Brazil where they haven't been hit by this so bad. Um, this is a spread throughout the U.S. It's in Texas. It's in Arizona. Um, it has yet to get into the Central Valley of California where we grow the remaining most of our citrus. Um, and that's largely due to environmental issues because it's a little bit too cool for the Asian citrus psyllid. However, based upon global climate change models, we expect it to get warm enough for the psyllid. And then it, logic would suggest then eventually greening will move through where we grow the rest of our citrus. So this is an existential threat to you as citrus. And there's a great chance uh, we will we'll have, we'll have a harder time getting citrus products, lemons, limes, oranges, things like that in the future. So the study of plant diseases is critical for the maintenance and advancement of, of our society. 
the plant pathologist community is well, we have one Nobel laureate. His name is Norman Borlaug. And I like this quote. Um, and it's right, Jack, it's Florida orange juice. Civil, civilization as we know it today could not have evolved nor can it survive without an adequate food supply. Microbes lust for nothing more in this world than eating the plants we also like to eat. So it's really, really important for people like myself, for Dr. Gwynn, for other folks in Tennessee and Kentucky and all throughout the country and world who devote our lives to try and maintain a healthy food supply that allows us to you know, live a healthy and happy life uh, in, in the pursuit of our dreams. So that's all the material I have for you guys today. Uh, I will stop my share here so I can actually see your faces and toss it over to Trixie to see if there's any questions. I know I talked for a little bit longer than planned, but hopefully it didn't blow up the schedule too bad. And very active on the chat too, I appreciate that. Um, would everyone like to um, provide Dr. Hurst some questions? And you could unmute, unmute your mic and talk, or I could see the chat right here too, whatever's more convenient for y'all. I don't know if you guys drink coffee yet. Coffee is also imperiled. Um, and one reason why the British drink tea instead of coffee is because the same disease came around in the 1800s, 1700s, and wiped out a lot of their um, coffee production in, uh, in, the, in the tropics. But they had just colonized India where they grew a lot of tea. So they're able to get their caffeine fix from tea. And they, and they, and they never dropped it. Does the banana disease affect plantains or, or are they resistance to their, or, or do they have a resilience to the disease? That's a good question. I don't know if it's, if it can infect plantains. I don't believe so. I haven't heard that, but that's something I could certainly look up. Uh, Dr. Gwynn, do you know? You're the other expert here. I think, I actually, I, I spend an entire class time talking about the okay. banana problem. And yeah, there are some, they, they are losing some of the uh, starch bananas uh, to, to the new race. Okay. And then, so bananas and apples have many versions of them. What other fruits and veggies are going to expand in the future? Oh, so you mean like, like what other varieties are we going to start seeing more types of? That's a great question. And I would probably have to ask my colleagues in different flavors of agriculture about that. Um, I'm really happy to, I'm sad about Panama disease and bananas, but I've had really good bananas when I've traveled the world and gone to cool places, and I wish we have some of those bananas too. Um, I see lots of variety in squashes coming through. Um, I think if you go to, I think Dr. Gwynn mentioned there's a Whole Foods up, up, but you guys generally like the sort of organic, um, the stores that cater to um, a more wealthy clientele, you'll often see that go first because those are kind of niche products where there's not a big market for them, so they're a little bit more expensive. But um, that's where I would look first for different um, products. Dr. Gwynn, do you, do you have any thoughts on new things coming around? I hope I know, more onions, I know too. There's, I several, onions. there's several new uh, apple varieties that are coming out right now. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the ones that remain crisp. Yeah, so uh, Arctic Crisp, it's a genetically engineered variety of apple. They've genetically engineered, it's a, it's a gene or enzyme called peroxidase that the plant uses to defend itself when it's wounded. It also makes the cut edge of apples turn brown and they've knocked out that gene so the apple can't produce those chemicals. So when you cut an apple, it just doesn't turn brown. And we waste, I forget the specific numbers, but it's tens of millions of dollars a year in food waste of just school-age children throwing out brown apple slices that we could get, a, that, that we're trying to get around now with these genetically engineered Arctic crisp apples. Um, so the citrus, oh, so let me look here. Okay, uh, Bruce, which universities have strong program in plant pathology? Well, UT Knoxville and Kentucky are very clearly at the apex of the field. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of land grant colleges do. So those are gonna be colleges that serve consumers and growers throughout the country. Um, Purdue has a big one. Cornell uh, had a big one. Uh, things ebb and flow. Uh, I mean, uh, Wisconsin, all your big sort of ag state schools will generally California. have- huh? California. California has a bunch. UC Davis is one of the real big ones. UC Riverside. Um, some are standalone, like plant pathology at UK is our own thing. A lot have combined with entomology. You study insects, because as we've shown here, there's lots of interplay between insects and pathogens. Um, Purdue is uh, put in with, I think, like microbiology or botany. Lots of different combinations. Um, so the citrus disease with global warming, will most citrus go extinct? I mean, in far time, unless we find a way to stop it. Well, right now, all the citrus trees are susceptible to this greening uh, disease. 
And uh, it is an existential threat to citrus. There are some really cool, but this is a big deal. So people are caring about it and doing research. There are some genetic engineering approaches where scientists have developed uh, genetically engineered trees that are resistant to this. Uh, in one case that I'm familiar with, they took a gene from spinach, I believe, and put this one gene of, in spinach into that orange tree. And the gene from spinach, all it did was like act like a burglar alarm kind of. So these bacteria and citrus can evade the burglar. Alarm. They can like cut the telephone wires in the movie, right? And then sneak in. This spinach uh, uh, gene acted like a burglar alarm the bacteria could not avoid. So all the spinach gene did was just trigger the natural citrus defense responses, and that resulted in a resistant citrus tree. But uh, people in our society are generally resistant to eating um, genetically engineered plants. Uh, so we have the technology for it, but there's not a social acceptance to the point where that will be, that, that is a process we can use. Um, there's some other projects going on where folks have identified different chemicals that are naturally produced by citrus plants that they can spray on the plant that also trigger defense responses too. So it'll be kind of a combined approach, I think. Um, and, and the USDA has put a lot of money into make, funding that research. Yes. So when, when, when problems are big and like, you know, existential and costly like this, our government swings into big action because there's a lot of interest in maintaining citrus. It's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. Um, produce in the same broad family stretch across the family, or is it specific to one species? Does it depend on the disease? So CC, so produce in the same broad family stretch across the family, or is it specific to one disease? I don't think I understand your question. So CC, can you ask that again? And I'll come back to it as I read. That was a direct question to me. Um, J Jack Alexander, my family's going to plant a lemon tree. Should we have to worry about citrus greening this far north? That's a good question. I'm not sure about the northern, you know, range of the citrus psyllid. I'd have to look. I'm only familiar with this in the sort of normal production areas. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, in the future, are we likely to see a rise of GMO foods being sold in the stores? Yeah, we're seeing it now. Right now, there's these Arctic crisp apples, potatoes are um, many potato varieties are now genetically engineered to be resistant to the early blight pathogen and then also not to brown as much so we lose less during transit. Um, there's also some genetically engineered food items. Um, Aqua Advantage salmon are genetically engineered um, to grow faster. Uh, papayas have been genetically engineered forever but we don't eat a lot of papayas. Um, I think it's going to be more and more common uh, as people become more used to and comfortable with the technology and as our previous generation of disease control, or just control mechanisms start not to work and we're presented with an issue of, we want this plant, like do we want this plant in any way or do we not wanna have any genetic engineering at all? And I think a lot of people who strongly believe against genetic engineering may reconsider their decisions if they're confronted with the loss of a favorite food item. But that's just my opinion. We'll see how things pan out. They already um, have. They already have a banana in Australia that's completely resistant to Panama disease. The new race. Okay, very cool. Um, how will genetic modifications help combat the extinction of different plants? Well, that's a great question. Uh, well, so one thing, it's not extinct yet, but one thing I didn't talk about is the American chestnut that used to be the predominant tree in eastern forests. So from Maine down to Mississippi, including huge parts of Tennessee and Kentucky, that was. Uh, in parts of Kentucky, I close my eyes and I think of all the trees I see in the forest, 50% of all the trunk volume of all the wood used to be American chestnut. Now it's almost nothing because they were almost all wiped out by uh, an invasive fungus that we accidentally imported in the 1910s from China um, called Cryphonectria parasitica, but it blew through because the American chestnuts were super susceptible for it. Uh, to it. Um, right now, there are some genetically engineered American chestnuts that either have or will very soon be released in the eastern forests to try and resist this pathogen. And it'll take, if those stick, it'll take probably 20 or 30 or 40, 50 or 80 years for uh, chestnuts to maybe start coming back in different parts of our forests. But there's a new pathogen called Phytophthora cinnamomi that's killing all the American chestnuts south of the Mason-Dixon. So we can't, you know, you can't win. We spend 40 years developing this new variety of tree and then something new comes in and kills half of the, half of the trees. Um, so citrus, for example, does one disease hit all citrus or just lemon? So in this case, it's all citrus. Um, there are some, there are lots of other citrus diseases. Uh, citrus canker, I know is a big deal in grapefruit and orange. 
I don't know how that affects other citrus varieties. I'd have to look. Um, but in this case, this pathogen is broadly pathogenic across all citrus plants. But some are species specific and some can only affect you know, others depending upon their genetics. Um, could you give some possible ideas for a science fair project that is along these lines we're discussing to give us some ideas maybe? So that's a great question. Um, you know, some of this, and, and, and this would probably be better suited for, for more in-depth discussions with Dr. Gwen, just because she's, she's a resident expert in this and is around with you guys more often than me. I'm just here tonight. But one thing that I've done that's been really interesting for my students in classes and is actually pretty cheap and doable is, um, I've talked to Dr. Gwen about this in depth, but if you, if you ever had a potato or onion go bad in the pantry, and it gets really stinky and soft and gushy, that's a post-harvest disease we call bacterial soft rot. And these, these bacteria live in the soil and they, uh, when you improperly store a potato or onion and they get wet somewhere in the bag probably, then these bacteria will be able to infect and then cause it to rot. And you can use those rotten potatoes as a source of inoculum to do really cool controlled experiments on different produce you'd buy at the store. So actually this Thursday for one of my classes, I'm gonna go buy $150 of stuff from Kroger in the morning, potatoes, apples, squash, whatever I could buy, maybe something neat, bananas, I don't know, whatever they have in the, in the fancy section. And then we're gonna, the students are gonna structure controlled experiments with all the produce I buy to see what aspects of host physiology. So like does pH matter? You know, is lemons, you know, more resistant than oranges? Uh, does the purple pigment in onions matter? Or per, you know, purple onions versus white onions have different resistances? And um, that may not be like the most sort of Nobel prize winning sort of science, because it's cheap and you can do so much technical replication with a bag of potatoes, you can get really you know, good enough data to actually say something meaningful in a way that is both kind of exciting, I think, for someone in your position just to have a hypothesis and go to the store and do it. And it doesn't take any fancy equipment because you do it at home. It's stinky. Ask your parents. It's very bad if you have a big bag of rotten potatoes. Um, but uh, it's stuff you can do. It doesn't take any fancy safety equipment. It's all normal waste stream stuff. Um, yeah, you could consider doing something like that. Those are always fun for me and my students get a lot of joy out of it and I never know what's going to happen. It's also fun for me. I could kind of just go in and, and just, you know, see what happens. Yeah. We also have another plant pathologist who is our uh, natural science graduate student mentor. Oh, okay. So Aaron would be a good person to bounce ideas off at our next session. Okay. Yeah. And something too, I'll just share with Dr. Gwynn now and not belabor too much of this, but I've used a botrytis. So if you've ever had strawberries, or blueberries or blackberries go fuzzy in the fridge. That's probably a fungal pathogen called botrytis scenaria. And you can actually with toothpicks, get that botrytis and then poke them into apples. And the fungus will start to radially colonize the apple over about seven days. And you could do some pretty easily, some pretty easy research to find the different chemical components of different varieties of apples. And if you care to, someone would have to help you learn a little bit about fungal biology, but you can then look at, you know, well, do I expect this fungus to colonize Granny Smith apples differently than Gala apples because of pH differences or different sugar concentrations or stuff like that? And again, that's, you, you'd have to do a bit more, you know, book reading on that, but it's also pretty, pretty cheap and you could do lots of reps to get good quality data. I'm thinking graphs, charts, things like that. Um, a few more here. And then Trixie, if, if we got a roll, I don't know what your time frame is here, but I think the questions have kind of stopped coming in. So maybe uh, yeah, there was one more from Jack and then we'll go and um, wrap up. Okay. So, uh, so produce is not supposed to rot. Uh, it does because it gets infected. Yeah. So um, there's, uh, yeah. So produce in a perfect environment that's uh, without microbes will probably just slowly dry up. Um, but there's microbes everywhere. There's even microbes on the landers we send to Mars. I mean, NASA has a very small but acceptable minimum of microbial contaminants that's on that. So we've already put life on Mars, probably. It just was transported from someone's thumbprint on a Mars lander somewhere. Um, so yeah, but in the absence of pathogens, they just kind of dry up into nuggets. Um, but there's always a pathogen. Or I can't, th there's one place on this planet where we haven't ever found a pathogen, and that's in the middle of Antarctica on the top of a mountain. And it's only exposed to about a foot because there's miles of ice in Antarctica. But as far as I'm aware of, that's the one place where humans have sampled anywhere on the planet where they haven't found any microbes. So when we're a far, far away from a mountaintop in Antarctica over here in Kentucky or Tennessee. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. 
Yes, so uh, everyone, thank you for your questions. I'm really glad that you guys engaged with Dr. Hirsch. Um, would you like to close up and say anything else, sir? Just thank you guys for doing this. I, I am profoundly worried about the direction of the world and the direction of our country. And it makes me so happy to see young people like you spending your free time like this, because this is how I think the next leaders of America are, are born and raised, is thinking deeply about stuff that's important, even if it's from some lowly plant pathologist from a different state. All of this stuff matters. And the fact that you guys care about it to me gives me a lot of hope for tomorrow. So keep doing what you're doing. And thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yes, thank you so much for coming by. Um, you can stick around or you can leave the, the meeting. We're just gonna wrap up real quick. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll stay around and see if anyone wants to talk. My son's already in bed at home. I got a text from my <laughs> wife, so I'm open for the rest of the night. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen real quick. All right, so again, um, that was uh, Dr. Robert Hirsch. So thank you so much for coming by. Um, while we were uh, going through the uh, guest speaker, um, we I did select a person for our um, Friends of ORNL incentive. And I picked Nikolai Stump. I believe you're still here. Can you say hello in the chat for me? Oh, perfect. Okay. So um, go ahead and email uh, prep at utk.edu. Um, and um, you can go ahead and pick one of the five um, gifts to the side. And um, let's see. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, also, we have different platforms. If you guys are not um, familiar, here they are. Uh, you can go ahead and take a picture. Um, we have our prep newsletter that comes up every month. Um, we also have a Twitter account, an Instagram account, and also I say it's a Facebook page. Um, there I post a lot of our um, virtual science club meetings. Um, and then of course you'll get some updates um, from say Sub itself. Um, and Last thing, next Tuesday's meeting is October 4th, and that's where we're going to have our, um, our four mentors come by. Uh, you can RSVP here. Um, again, make sure I have this open. So our... Oh, I can't think... So we have natural science, physical science, human sciences, and um, engineering and math. So go ahead and um, click on, or excuse me, go to the QR code, register for next meeting. Um, again, it's gonna be October 4th with our mentors. Um, you'll be able to pick your mentor um, group as soon as we start the meeting, okay? Um, I guess that is it. If anyone has any questions, we'll hang out real quick. But if not, you guys have a good night. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. I think. Good night. Bye-bye. I don't know, Lou. Maybe you ought to send some of these comments to your department head. <laughs> You're a real hit. I know. This is super fun. And this is, you know, these a lot of these Zoom things just just suck you know because there's no engagement and stuff but this was great can you send yeah. these kids can you enroll these kids in the university of kentucky and have them come here that'd be that'd be wonderful no no no, no yeah geez, you don't want to lose them huh this is the office of admissions what do you think <laughs> you're talking to the wrong people yeah well you you guys have a great crop of scholars here this is just fantastic i yeah. really really good question so thank you so much you did a great job um it was well, I really enjoyed your talk as well. <laughs> well, thank you guys. And I, uh, and the Ken, you're, you're going to visit us here about a month, right? For the hemp conference. Yeah. I'll be up there at the first week of November for the hemp conference and uh, hopefully still come in and 
see your class. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me know. Actually, that, that same period of time is a Kentucky Science Teacher Academy meeting, so I'm doing stuff with that too, but okay. we can try and connect. If it doesn't work, if it doesn't life, work, but, but I, I, I would love for you to swing by. So Okay. All righty. Hey, well, thank you all very much. I mean, Kim knows me real well from our professional society, but if there's anything you think I could do to help this mission out, just let me know. This is part of my job, but I also really like doing it. So those two things together, I'm always game for stuff. So just let yeah. me know. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I may get your lab protocol at some point for the for the rotten potato experiments. Okay, let me know. I have it here where I, when we're working on a publication too for the American biology teacher, which I, I need okay. to kind of get off the get off my plate. So thanks for subtly encouraging me.